Before today's video starts, we just want to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, Audible. With the holidays wrapping up, why not reward yourself for getting through them by getting yourself a membership to Audible. With an Audible membership, every month you get a credit for a free audiobook and two Audible originals. They also have amazing exclusive sales, and if you want to buy an additional audiobook, you'll get 30% off. If you're interested in Audible, go to audible.com slash criminally listed or text criminally listed to 500 500 to get a free audiobook, two free Audible originals, and a 30-day free trial. There are a ton of great audiobooks you can choose from, but I recommend American Predator by Maureen Callahan, which details the life and crimes of the mysterious and vicious serial killer, Israel Keys. American Predator is haunting and disturbing, but it's hard to stop listening because it's so fascinating. If you're looking to get in shape in the new year, Audible also has exclusive audio fitness and health workouts. Or exercise your mind while you're exercising your body with a great true crime Audible original. An Audible original you should check out is Call Me God. It's about the investigation into the DC sniper shootings and it's told by the actual investigators who worked on the case. Just go to audible.com slash criminally listed or text criminally listed to 500 500 to get a free audiobook, two Audible originals, and a 30 day free trial. By checking out Audible, you'll also be supporting Criminally Listed. Number 3 Linda O'Keefe. In the summer of 1973, Linda O'Keefe was 11 years old. She lived with her mother, father, and her two sisters in Newport Beach, California. Linda was the middle child. She loved doing crafts and playing the piano. On the morning of July 6, 1973, Linda attended summer school. After classes ended for the day, she called her mother and asked for a ride home. Her mother told her to walk the mile home. Tragically, 11-year-old Linda did not make it home and she was reported missing. Her body was found the next morning in a ditch about three miles away from the school in the opposite direction that she would have walked home. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. After the murder made the news, a woman contacted the police. She said she saw Linda walking home. Parked on the street where she saw Linda was a turquoise van. The man who was driving the van had curly hair and he was in his mid-twenties or early thirties. The police were not sure if the man was involved in Linda's disappearance. Whether he was involved or not, the police never found the man with the turquoise van. The police had several suspects, but no one was ever charged with Linda's murder. It wasn't long before the case went cold. Decades went by, and the loss was hard on Linda's family. Linda's mother was racked with guilt for the rest of her life for not picking up Linda from school when she called for a ride. Linda's mother died in 2005. While Linda's case was cold, it was never forgotten by the homicide detectives in Newport Beach. Her photograph was always hanging up in their squad room. When DNA testing became more prevalent, Linda's clothes were examined. Some male DNA was found and a profile was created. The profile was entered into CODIS, but no match was made. In 2018, the DNA profile was given to Parabon Nano Labs. They created two composite images of what the killer might look like. One was what he might have looked like in 1973 when Linda was killed. 
The other one was what you may have looked like in 2018. But the composite images did not lead to an arrest. Then in April 2018, Joseph James D'Angelo was arrested in connection with the Golden State Killer murders and the world of criminal justice was forever changed. In January 2019, investigators working on Linda O'Keefe's case used the website FamilyTreeDNA.com to fill out the family tree of Linda's killer. They narrowed it down to a 72-year-old man named James Neal. James Neal was not his birth name. His birth name is James Albert Lane Jr. and he was born in Chicago, Illinois in July 1946. His family moved to California in 1955. Neil had his first brushes with the law when he was 13 years old. He was arrested twice in as many months for burglary. Between 1959 and 1973, when Linda was killed, Neil had been arrested nearly a dozen times, mostly for burglaries. He was in and out of jail most of that time. On two separate occasions, he escaped from custody. When Neil wasn't incarcerated, he worked odd jobs. At some point, Neil was living in Florida and he changed his name to James Albert Neal. When the investigators linked Neil's DNA to the DNA left on Linda's dress, he was living in Colorado Springs, Colorado with his daughter. On February 19, 2019, nearly 46 years after Linda O'Keefe's murder, Neil, who was 72, was arrested. A month later, he was charged with two counts of sexual assault on girls under the age of 14. One incident supposedly happened in 1995, and the other one supposedly occurred in 2004. Neil has pleaded not guilty to all the charges. Number 2. Dorothy Fielding In June 1967, 48-year-old Ruby Lamson was reported missing. Lamson lived in an apartment above the Falls View Tavern in Spokane, Washington. Lamson was a regular at the tavern. But on the night of June 7th, she was at a different bar that was a short distance away. She was last seen talking to a younger man. The police investigated the disappearance, but they didn't find any clues. On August 19, 1967, just over two months after Lampson vanished, 31-year-old Dorothy Fielding was reported missing. Fielding was married, and she worked at a grocery store in Spokane. Three days later, her car was found abandoned in the parking lot of a grocery store in Spokane. It was not the grocery store where she worked. In the ashtray of the car, there were some fresh cigarette butts. Fielding's friends and family said that she didn't smoke. Fielding's friends and family told the police that several days before Fielding went missing, she found flowers and handwritten notes in her car. The flowers and the notes were from an anonymous admirer. Fielding's friends said she was creeped out by the notes and the flowers. The police learned that when Fielding went missing, she was about 20 weeks pregnant. Fielding was married, but she had been having an affair with 34-year-old Duke Pearson. Duke was the security manager at the grocery store where Dorothy worked. The police interviewed Duke and he said that he had dated Fielding, but he didn't know what happened to her. He also said he couldn't be the father of Fielding's baby because he had a vasectomy. Duke also said that he knew that Fielding had gotten flowers and notes from a secret admirer. 
While Fielding's friend said that she thought that the notes and flowers were creepy, Duke said she was proud of them. One thing that the police did note was that Fielding found three types of flowers in her car. When Fielding and Duke started dating, Duke was still legally married to a woman named Sandra, but they were living apart. In her garden, Sandra grew two of the types of flowers that Fielding found in her car. Duke's mother grew the third type of flower in her garden. But this did not prove that Duke had anything to do with Fielding's disappearance, so the police dropped Duke as a suspect. On April 7, 1968, the body of a woman was found in a shallow grave off a logging road about 12 miles northwest of Spokane. The boy was clothed in a grocery store uniform and a name tag was pinned to the shirt. The name tag read Dorothy. It was later confirmed that the remains were 31-year-old Dorothy Fielding, who went missing eight months earlier. Because of the state of the remains, the medical examiner could not determine the cause of death. The discovery of her remains did not lead to an arrest in her murder. Then on November 16, 1971, the remains of 48-year-old Ruby Lampson were found northwest of Spokane. She had been missing for over four years. Lampson's body was found in a shallow grave 1.8 miles away from where Fielding's body was buried. Like Fielding, Lampson's cause of death could not be determined. After Lampson's remains were found, the police thought that the murders were committed by the same person. Both women went missing within two months of each other, and they were both buried in shallow graves less than two miles away from each other. But the police couldn't determine who killed them if the cases went cold. In 2008, a detective named Kurt Keyser reviewed Ruby Lampson's case. The review did not lead to any breaks in the case. Ten years later, in April 2018, Detective Keyser got a phone call. The person was calling to see if there had been any updates in the murder of Dorothy Fielding. The caller mentioned that Fielding had been on the bowling team for a bar she frequented, the Falls View Tavern. Detective Keyser noted the name of the bar and thought that it sounded familiar. He looked into Ruby Lampson's file and he read that Lampson lived above the Falls View Tavern and she was a regular in the bar room. Detective Keyser then began to dig into both case files. He learned that Lampson and Fielding were both regulars at the Falls View Tavern and they were even acquaintances. This convinced Keyser that the murders were connected. Keyser also found a person of interest, Duke Pearson. Duke was also a regular at the Falls View Tavern. When both women went missing, Duke had been married to a woman named Sandra and they had been having marital problems. Just before Lampson went missing, Duke had moved out of his family's home and into an apartment a few blocks from the Falls View Tavern. Keyser decided to dig deeper into Duke's background. In 1959, Duke joined the Spokane County Sheriff's Department. But seven years later, in 1966, he resigned. He said he resigned because he got a job as a security manager at a grocery store and they paid better than the Sheriff's Department. Keyser managed to track down people who worked with Duke in the Sheriff's Department. They all told a very different story about his resignation. They said that Duke simply stopped showing up for work. Several co-workers had called him to ask why he had stopped showing up for work and he threatened to kill them. The sheriff wanted to fire Duke 
but as a courtesy, he allowed him to resign. Several co-workers considered him to be mentally unstable. After Duke resigned, a few of his co-workers openly discussed that they thought that he was dangerous and he could harm someone. This included the sheriff of Spokane County. Several weeks after Duke resigned, he moved out of the home that he shared with his wife Sandra and their two children. At some point, Duke started dating Dorothy Fielding. Then, on June 7th, Ruby Lamson disappeared. Sometime after that, Duke traveled to Hawaii. In Hawaii, Duke wrote a letter to his estranged wife, Sandra, and told her to join him there. She did, and the two rekindled their relationship. When they returned from Hawaii, Dorothy Fielding told Duke she was pregnant, and he was the father. At first, Duke didn't believe her because he had a vasectomy. But Duke had told his cousin that he went to a doctor and he learned that his vasectomy was not successful. A few weeks after Fielding told Duke she was pregnant, she went missing. When Fielding's car was found abandoned, in the ashtray of her car was fresh cigarette butts. Fielding did not smoke, but Duke did. Ruby Lamson and Dorothy Fielding were not the only women connected to Duke who died unnatural deaths in 1967. On September 12, 1967, a month after Fielding went missing, Duke's wife, 33-year-old Sandra Pearson, was found dead in the backseat of her car, which was parked in the family's garage. Sandra was 20 weeks pregnant. A hose led from the exhaust pipe into a rear window that was open to crack. Sandra had died from carbon monoxide poisoning. The police ruled it a suicide. Two months after his wife's death, Duke got remarried. They would end up getting divorced less than five years later because Duke was controlling and possessive. Several people do not think that Sandra took her own life. Duke's second wife, his two children, his cousin, and his cousin's son all think that he had something to do with his wife's death. About 45 minutes before Sandra was found dead, she had been talking to her mother on the phone. Sandra said she was getting ready for work and her mother did not notice anything unusual about her. Also, the only way in and out of the garage was through the garage door. When Sandra was found dead, the garage door was closed. But the garage door was malfunctioning and you needed a lot of strength to close it. Sandra was a petite woman and her family said she couldn't close the garage door by herself. Duke's second wife, whom he married two months after Sandra died, said that she was not able to close the door by herself. Duke's second wife, whom he married two months after Sandra died, said that she was not able to close the door by herself. The problem with their theory that Duke killed Sandra was how did he force her to sit in the car while the car filled with carbon monoxide? Many people that Detective Keezer interviewed said that Duke was able to hypnotize people. He learned to do it by practicing on Sandra, who was exceptionally vulnerable to it. Several people claim that when Sandra was hypnotized, Duke was able to get her to do things that she didn't want to do. Duke was supposedly able to make her do things the day after she was hypnotized. So Duke's family thinks that he hypnotized Sandra and then ordered her to stay in the car. They think he had tried to kill her this way before, but he failed. When Duke was in Hawaii in the summer of 1967, he wrote Sandra a letter trying to convince her to come to Hawaii. 
the letter must have worked because Sandra traveled to Hawaii and they got back together. Duke's son still had the letter that he sent from Hawaii. In the letter, Duke apologizes for a vaguely described incident involving a hose. Duke's children also said that he acted strangely after their mother died. When Duke got the autopsy report, which indicated that Sandra was 20 weeks pregnant, he showed it to the neighbors and told them that she had been pregnant with another man's baby. There's a lot of speculation about why Duke wanted to kill Sandra. She may have found out that Dorothy Fielding, who went missing a month earlier, was pregnant with Duke's child. Or Duke simply didn't want to be married to Sandra any longer. His family pointed out that he did get married two months after Sandra's death. Or he may not have wanted another child. He had a vasectomy, so he was not planning on having any more children. Or, it may have even been possible that the baby was another man's, or at least Duke thought it was another man's child, and he became enraged, and he killed Sandra. Many people told Detective Keezer that Duke was a jealous, controlling, and abusive man. Neither of his children talked to him. Duke got married and divorced two more times, and he dated several women. All the women who had relationships with Duke that Detective Keezer interviewed said that Duke was controlling and he had threatened to kill them. Some women said that he had hinted that he had killed before and he had gone away with it. Duke Pearson only had one major run-in with the law. In June 1974, he was one of 23 people who were arrested for being part of a drug ring that smuggled cocaine from Bolivia into the United States. In February 1975, he was sentenced to two years in prison plus three years of probation. In the spring of 2018, Detective Keezer found Duke living in Andalusia, Alabama. Detective Keezer traveled there to interview Duke, who was 84 years old. Duke said that he did not remember dating Dorothy Fielding. Duke told Detective Keezer that they may have dated for a week or so, but he had dated thousands of women, so he couldn't remember. Duke said his wife, Sandra, had left him a widower when she died by suicide. He said that when she died, she was pregnant with another man's baby. Duke denied he was abusive, and he claimed he had never been violent. He also said that he had never threatened anyone. Detective Keezer asked Duke if he had ever been to prison. Duke said he had, but he said it was for something minor, and he said he couldn't even remember the crime he had been convicted of. After interviewing Duke, Keezer continued to investigate the three cases. By January 2019, Keezer thought that he had enough circumstantial evidence to arrest Duke for the murder of Dorothy Fielding. On January 25th, a warrant for Duke Pearson's arrest was filed, but it was too late. Duke had died of natural causes in his home three days earlier at the age of 85. If he did kill any of the women, he got away with it. Number 1. The Wasung Strangler Wasung is a rural city in the Gangi province, which is South Korea's most populous province. It is about 25 miles south of the capital, Seoul. Wasung is home to a series of disturbing serial murders. The first one happened on September 15, 1986. 71-year-old Lee Wanim was sexually assaulted and strangled to death as she was walking home from her daughter's home. 
Just over a month later, on October 20th, 1986, 25-year-old Park Hun Shuk was murdered. She was also strangled to death. Two months later, on December 12th, 1986, 25-year-old Kuan Sheng Ban was strangled to death near her home. Like the first two victims, she had been sexually assaulted and strangled. The killer struck again two days later. 23-year-old Lee Kai Suk was strangled to death as she was walking home from the bus stop. She had been sexually violated with an umbrella that she was carrying. A month later, on January 19, 1987, 19-year-old Hong Jin Young was killed as she was heading home from school. The life had been choked out of her. The killer claimed his sixth known victim on May 2nd, 1987, about four months after the last murder. She was 29-year-old Park Yun Jo. She was strangled to death while she was out running an errand. 54-year-old Ang Gi Soon was strangled to death as she was walking home on September 7, 1987. Then it appeared that the killer took a break for just over a year. Then on September 16, 1988, 14-year-old Park Sang Hee was strangled to death in her bed. In her bedroom, the police found a hair that did not belong to Sang Hee. A year later, the police arrested a 22-year-old man named Young Sung Yao on a minor crime. They got a hair sample from Yun and compared it to the killer's hair. An expert declared it was a match. Yun was brought in for questioning and he confessed to killing Sang Hee. But the police could not connect him to any of the other murders. They eventually came up with an explanation. Sang Hee's murder was slightly different from the other murders that were committed by the Wasung Strangler. Notably, the killer broke into the victim's home and killed her there. In all his previous crimes, the Strangler attacked the victim as they were heading home. The police concluded that Yoon was a copycat of the Strangler. In 1989, Yun was convicted of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. Over a year after Yun was sentenced, on November 15, 1990, 14-year-old Kim Majong was attacked on her way home from school. Like all the other victims, she was sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Less than five months later, on April 3, 1991, 69-year-old Kuan Soon Sang was strangled to death. She was killed as she was walking home from the bus. Then the killing suddenly came to an end. The killer had taken breaks before, only to return to kill more women, and people feared that this was just another temporary break. But when no other women were attacked at Wa Sung in the years afterwards, the citizens started to breathe a little bit easier. The police were sure that one man committed all nine unsolved murders. All the victims were attacked while they were walking alone, usually early in the morning or late at night. Besides being strangled, all the victims were sexually assaulted as well. The killer didn't carry a murder weapon. Most of the victims were choked with their own clothes or the killer used his hands. Many times the victims were bound and their mouths were stuffed with their bras, stockings, or socks. Also, the same fingerprints were found at multiple crime scenes. The police had one witness who possibly saw the killer. It was a bus driver who saw a man walking away from an area where one of the women were killed. The bus driver's description resulted in this sketch. 
but no matter what the police did or what evidence they had, the identity of the killer eluded them for decades. Over two million police officers worked on the case. They interviewed and cleared over 21,000 suspects. They also collected fingerprints from over 40,000 people. But nothing they did led them to the killer. The case of the Wasung Strangler eventually went cold. The case was massive news in South Korea. The Wasung Strangler is considered South Korea's first serial killer. The crimes were the basis for the incredibly popular movie Memories of Murder, which was released in 2003. At the time of the killings, South Korea had a 15-year statute of limitations on murder. That meant the police had until April 2006 to find the strangler or he could never be charged with the crimes. But they did not find him in time. In 2009, Yoon Sung Yao was paroled for good behavior. During the 19 and a half years he spent in prison, Yoon swore he was innocent. He claimed he was tortured into confessing. He said he was sleeping at home when Park Sing He was killed. But his claims fell on deaf ears. Even though the Wasung Strangler could never face charges for the nine murders, the evidence from the crime scenes was examined periodically. In September 2019, using the most sophisticated DNA technology available, they found male DNA on evidence from four of the crime scenes. The DNA was then compared to the DNA of prison inmates. It was matched to a 56-year-old man named Lee Shanje. Lee was serving a life sentence in Busan, which is a city on the other side of South Korea from Wasong. When the investigators looked into Lee's background, they became convinced that he was the strangler. After Lee finished mandatory military service in 1986, he was living in Wasong. Sometime in 1987, he was questioned about the May 1987 murder of 29-year-old Park Yun Jo. She was the sixth known murder victim. Lee, who was working for a construction company at the time, denied knowing anything about the murder. The police had no evidence to connect him to the crimes, so he was dropped as a suspect. In 1991, Lee got married and had a son, and they moved to the nearby city of Chengju. After he moved, the murders of Wasong came to an end. In December 1993, Lee's wife left him. On January 13, 1994, Lee invited his wife's 20-year-old sister, whose name was never made public, over to his home. She did not return home from her visit. Lee went over to his father-in-law's home and he offered to help look for her. Her dead body was found days later. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. A police officer who worked on the case suspected that Lee may have had something to do with the murder because he was acting oddly. The officer went over to Lee's home and he saw that he was packed up and ready to move. The officer brought Lee in for questioning. After several hours, Lee asked how much time someone gets in prison for sexual assault and murder. This further convinced the officer that Lee was guilty. Lee was arrested five days after his sister-in-law went missing. They searched Lee's home and they found DNA in the drain of his bathtub. The DNA belonged to Lee's sister-in-law. In May 1994, 
Lee was convicted of killing his sister-in-law and he was sentenced to death. In 1995, his sentence was reduced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years. This made him eligible for parole in 2014. But when the police linked his DNA to the four Wasung murders, he was still in prison. In October 2019, Lee was interviewed and he initially denied committing the murders. But the interviewer went back several times to talk to him over the next 12 days. Then Lee started talking. He confessed to the nine unsolved Wasung murders. He also confessed to the murder that Young Sung Yao had been convicted of in 1989. Lee then confessed to more crimes that the police had no idea he committed. This included 30 sexual assaults or attempted sexual assaults and four more murders. If the police know the names of the victims or the dates of the murders, they have not made them public. If Lee is being truthful, this brings his body count to 15, including his sister-in-law. Lee can never be charged with the other 14 murders because the statute of limitation has run out. He was identified over 28 years after he committed his last known murder, it was Song. Also, he has been in prison for 25 years, so he can't be charged with the four murders he committed that the police did not know about. The Wasung murders are a significant reason why South Korea changed its laws regarding statute of limitations on murder. In 2005, the statute of limitations was changed to 25 years and then it was removed entirely in 2015. But these changes were not retroactive. Since Lee was already serving a life sentence, it's believed that he'll remain in custody and he will never be granted parole. After Lee confessed to the murder of Park Sang-hee, Young Sung yao who had been convicted of the crime in 1989, announced that he was seeking a new trial. Yoon, who was 52 when Lee confessed, has always proclaimed his innocence. The police have admitted that they most likely made a mistake in arresting Yoon. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, please check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash criminallylisted. Also, visit our website criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about an exclusive podcast. But that is all for today. Thank you again for watching.